Okay, let me get reset up here, and we'll uh, we'll get going. Want to again welcome those that are here. Welcome those that are online. We're actually starting a brand new series this week, and so I've been excited to kind of share this with you. Been kind of looking at it for over the last several months, actually, um, and been excited to share. Uh, this series with you. It's going to take about four or five weeks, and I'm excited to, to, to look at these things with you, because here's the deal. Like, sometimes it, 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 we, we kind of hear words, and we say things, and, and I don't know about you. Maybe you grew up in the church. Maybe you didn't. It's fine either way, but, but like I did, and sometimes I've had moments where I've been like, what does that even mean? Like, like, yeah, we say it all the time, but, but what does it mean? And I remember always hearing about this idea of we need to be the church. What? What does that look like? How do, how do we respond to that comment? How can we make sure that we're doing that? The title of our series for the next several weeks is the title, Family Ties. And I don't know about you, but, but I woke, I woke, you know, as a kid, I would watch all the television shows. And I don't know if you remember this particular show. But I remember watching it as a kid. I, I thought, you know, I thought it was funny. I mean, if you know anything about the show, basically, let me give you a quick little rundown of it. Basically, the whole concept of the show was basically based around the fact that you had these two parents who were basically ex-hippies from the 60s. Okay, and they were having, uh, they, they had left California, they moved to like Ohio or something, because I guess that's as further, you know, in the 80s away from California as you can be. And they had three kids, and then a, a, I think they got a fourth one later on or something or other. But I think the main concept of the whole show was the fact that their son, basically, that was played by Michael J. Fox, was exactly as opposite as you could possibly be from this family. Like, he would constantly have these issues with his mom and dad, but yet somehow they loved each other, somehow they made it all through, and somehow they did it all in about 22 minutes. It was amazing. <laughs> so this whole idea here that we're going to look at over the next several weeks is the idea of family ties. What, what does it really mean to be the church? What, what, how, did, how did God really desire for all this to be? Because here's the deal. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look around and I go, do we really understand what God intended. Now, here's the deal. As we look at this series together, I'm going to have to help, you're going to have to help me with something. Number one, you're going to have to kind of check your preconceived notions at the door. Because a lot of us, we come into these things with kind of lenses on. Like, we think we know this is what the church is supposed to be. This is what the church should look like. And here's the deal. Maybe those are going to be right. Maybe they're going to be wrong. But what I'm more interested in, and I hope what you're more interested in, is what was God's intention for the church? What is, what is it supposed to look like as far as how God sees it? Not how I see it, not how grandma sees it, but how the Lord meant for it to be. Because here's the deal. Like when you begin to study the scriptures and you begin to look at it, man, we really see this, especially in the New Testament, how the church is central to the plan of God and as far as what God is wanting to do in our hearts, in the hearts of our family, in the hearts of our church, in the hearts of our community. And sometimes if we miss what God's intentions are, we can miss what God desires to do. And I don't want us to do that. I want us to understand what this looks like. So over the next several weeks, we're going to kind of dissect this concept and look at, kind of see what does it really mean to basically be the church the way God desires it to be. Let's pray. Father, we love you. and We do thank you for this day and this time. God, as we look at these things together, I pray you'd open our hearts to what you desire to do. We love you so much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, here's the deal. As we look at these things, we're going to look at kind of some broad ideas. Some of these things are going to be big C church. Some of them are going to be little C church. When I say big C church, I mean the church as whole. When I say little C, I mean our church. And so as I'm looking through things and trying to kind of pick out things that I find in Scripture, one of the things that happens over and over and over again is this idea of family. And I don't know if you caught this, I've been here almost seven years now. If you haven't caught it yet, maybe you haven't been paying attention, but I use a word a lot when I talk about the idea and the concept of church, and it is the word family. When I grew up, I called my pastor, Pastor Johnson, and I called his wife, Sister Johnson. 
I had no idea why. It's just what you did. I remember being in church growing up and saying, well, this is brother so-and-so. This is sister so-and-so. And I remember being a five-year-old kid going, I don't think I've seen these people at Thanksgiving. <laughs> this, don't, this does not make sense to me. Like, like, like my mom has a sister and her name is Peggy. It's not Jody. I don't know how this is working out. And trying to understand. I remember going to my mom and dad and going, I don't understand. Why do we say these things? Why are we doing this? These aren't my relatives. And them helping me to understand that what's beautiful about the church is that God designed it to be like a family. Now, here's the deal. We're going to get to this in just a minute. For some of you, when I use that word, you kind of go a little like, mm, hold off. We'll get to there in a second. But God really designed this to be a family type of unit. And so it's very important to us, little c, to act that way. Now, do we always act that way? Oh, man, absolutely not. Does your family? We're not perfect people. But our desire, our hope, our prayer is that we can kind of develop a family type of atmosphere that is so important, I think so vital to what God desires the church to be. But let's look at that together. So what does it mean to be the family of God? What does this even look like? Well, listen, we could look at a lot of different scriptures. We're just going to look at one this morning in Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 2, we kind of begin to see a little bit of this pattern and a little bit of what it means as far as how God sees it, as far as the family of God. So listen to what it says. It says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Let's hold off there for just a minute. So let's give you a little context here. Paul is writing to a bunch of Gentiles. Paul is not a Gentile, he's Jewish. And so for dec well, not decades, centuries, there's always been this animosity between people that were Jewish and not Jewish. And one of the struggles that the early church really had was, how do we handle this? How do we, as Jewish people, how, does God want the Gentiles to come in? Does God not want the Gentiles to come in? How do we understand this? And God spoke very, very clearly through the, the book of Acts that God does desire for them to come in. But that sometimes it's hard for people to kind of change their mindsets a little bit. And so as Paul is writing to this church of Gentiles in Ephesus, he's basically telling them, look, you need to understand something. You're not separate. You're not away. You're not far away. You are part of God's family. And God, basically, Paul could have could used any type of imagery or understanding. And he said, no, 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 no. I want there to be some closeness. I want there to be some intimacy. I want there to be an understanding here. And so as through the, the power of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes, you are members of God's family. Now he continues on in verse 20. Together. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, become a holy temple for the Lord. I don't know if you noticed it here, but Paul in this scripture, these couple of verses, really kind of lays out what I kind of like to say. He really lays out for the church some family values. Some family values. I don't know if your family has values. I don't know if your family kind of looks at things and say, this is the type of family we're going to be, or this is the type of family we should be. <laughs> Maybe that's a better way to put it. But Paul is laying this out for us, and he's basically saying, let me kind of show you some values that need to be a part of this. And here's the deal. These need to be a part of big church, see? Big C church and little church, see? And this is what we strive to do. So let's look at these together, found here in Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. Number one. One of the first family values, we want all people to join the family, okay? We want all people to join the family. Like if you look at the world or you look at people and you go, you know, we want them but not them, you're missing it. We want everybody to come and find Jesus. We want everybody to discover him and grow in him. Every person, the most imperfect people and the most people that think they're perfect, we want them all. Why, Aaron? Why do you want them all? Simple, because Jesus does. Jesus does. He wishes that none should perish. And so as we're going to be a family, guess what? The family looks and says, listen, I want people to be a part of our family. 
It doesn't matter if it makes my life a little more uncomfortable. Maybe I can't find a parking space. Maybe the seat I like to sit in, somebody else sat in. Oh, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. We want people to join our family because Jesus wants them to join the family. Whoever God has, we want to welcome and say, you know what? If you don't have a family, you can have one here. We can love you like one. And that means sometimes imperfectly. But at the same time, we want you to be a part. Number two, the word of God is the foundation of the family. Listen, hear me here. I am not the foundation of this family. If you think that, I love you, but you're wrong. We're going to see who really is the foundation. It's Jesus, but well, that's next, so hold on. But with that is God's word. In the scripture, it talks about the teachings of the apostles and the foundation they left. Guess where that foundation is found today? It's found in your Bible. It's the things they wrote. It's the things that they spoke. It's the things that were shared and used by the power of the Holy Spirit as as he inspired them to write these words. Our foundation is not in culture. Our foundation is not in my whims or my desires or my thoughts or yours. Our foundation is scriptural. And here's the deal. Can I just be honest with you? So just so we understand this, because I, I, I want you to understand where things are headed a little bit. Standing on this as our foundation is not going to get easier. Okay? It's going to get a little bit harder as things go. But this is still our foundation. This is what we lean on. This is when we have issues and we don't know what to do. This is where we run. This is what leads us and guides us. Obviously, Jesus is a part of that. The Holy Spirit is a part of that. But a great part of that is also God's word. Number three, and we just kind of hit on it just a little bit. Jesus is the center of the family. Okay? The idea of a cornerstone basically is this. You remove that and a whole thing falls. Jesus is the center. I I don't know when it was. I I can't remember. I, I, you know, songs as I'm getting older, but kind of, kind of, kind of to blend together a little bit. But I just remember there was a song I used to hear, and and this was 20 some years ago, probably now, maybe even more, good Lord. And it was just, the first part of the song was this, Jesus is the center. Listen, Jesus needs to be the center of our personal life. Jesus needs to be the center of our family life. Jesus needs to be the center of our church life. Jesus needs to be the center of our work life. Jesus just needs to be the center. And that's what makes an amazing family. Not the perfection or imperfection. It's the fact that we have made Jesus the center. And everything goes to him. All glory, all honor, all praise. It is all about Jesus. Number four, the family is being carefully joined together to build something special. I like that. We're going to get a little more into that in a little bit. But listen, did you see what it said in Ephesians? The idea of carefully put together, that God isn't just basically, um, you know, taking a bunch of building supplies, throwing them on the ground and just seeing what happens. That God has a plan? That God is the perfect architect of what's happening here? And that God, as he's beginning to kind of move and shape and and, and do all these types of things, that man, he's doing it carefully. And he wants to build something really, really cool, really special. And here's what's great. And we're going to get into this more. He wants you to be a part of it. Everyone has a part to play in that. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. A lot of times when you start talking about family or talking about through these sort of things, everybody can tend to go, and there's nothing wrong with this, let's let's be honest, but let's be honest with ourselves. We can tend to basically think back to our earthly family. Well, my brother did this, or my mom did this. I don't know, Aaron, if I'm really interested in being a part of a family because of my earthly family because of what I have experienced in the past. And listen, can I, can I just challenge you on something? And I know this is going to be hard. Okay, and so I'm challenging you this, knowing that to accomplish it, you're going to need the help of the Holy Spirit. 
okay? This is one of those moments where basically we, 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 we remember the promise where basically God says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, okay? I want to challenge you no matter how good or perfect or imperfect, because here's the deal, here's the dirty little secret, there's no such thing as a perfect family. You may think, oh boy, if I just had them as a dad, or if I just had them as a mom, or boy, if that kid was my kid, listen, listen, hear me. They're not perfect either. They have their stuff too. And for some of us, man, it's so easy, but I'm going to challenge you to do this. No matter how perfect, quote unquote, or imperfect your earthly family is, don't hold that against Jesus. Because that's what we tend to do. We tend to say, Jesus can't be this type of father, or I can't have this type of family because these people have done these things. Don't hold it against Jesus. I know that's hard, but I really believe the Holy Spirit wants to bring some freedom to some of us because we're basically not willing to be a part of the family of God because our earthly family has hurt us. And I'm not trying to belittle that hurt. I'm simply wanting you to get freedom and healing from the hurt. You see, here's the thing. We need to remember that we serve a perfect Savior, not perfect people. Okay? I, one of the reasons I like, hear me here, one of the reasons I like the idea of calling the church a family is because I have never met a perfect one. Never once. Never had a perfect family. Never, never dreamed of having a perfect family. And most of us know that. But sometimes we get into the church setting and then we get upset that we don't have perfect people around us. And so we run off to another church. Oh, maybe there'll be perfect people over here. And then we get there and we go, oh my goodness, they're perfect. Two minutes pass. They're not. Okay, we've got to go over here. We've got to find them perfect over here. You're not going to find it. It doesn't exist. We serve a perfect Savior. So our eyes and our focus is on Him knowing that the people that are part of our family aren't always going to be perfect. But listen to what Peter says in his first letter. 1 Peter 2, 17, the very first part. Listen to this command that he gives. He says, respect everyone and love the family of believers. So what does that mean? It means our job as a family is to love each other even in our imperfections. I am so grateful, and all the husbands are going to agree with me, that our wives love us. Don't laugh, Megan. That is not what we're wanting here. I'm sorry. I just looked over there. She was giggling because she knew where I was going. We don't, we don't have, you don't have perfect husbands, but yet you love us anyway. You know what's cool? I know it's going to sound weird. Maybe I'm just weird. The times that I feel the most loved by people is when they love me in my mess. When they basically say, you know what? Yeah, Aaron, I know you did something dumb or said something dumb. I love you anyway. I forgive you. Let's move on together. I mean, in those moments, you go, wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. So let's continue. Who builds this family and how does construction take place? Because I think sometimes we can mistake this and not misunderstand this in a lot of ways. And a lot of times the people that are up here, like me, can make the biggest mistakes. But let's look at this together. Let's look at how this family's built, who builds it. Matthew 16. Matthew 16, I'm going to give you a little context here. Jesus is with his disciples and he, he basically asks them a question. He says, who do people say I am? It's a great question. Now, here's the deal. Here's the thing we need to understand about Jesus. Jesus doesn't ask questions because he doesn't know the answers. Okay? Sometimes we read that. Does Jesus not know? Jesus knows. Jesus doesn't ask questions because he doesn't know the answers. Jesus asks questions because he wants to take people on a journey so they can get their questions answered. Okay? So Jesus asks them, who do people say I am? And they begin to say, well, people are saying this, people are saying that. People are saying this, people are saying that. And then we pick up the story in Matthew 16, 15. And this is a question, by the way, that Jesus will ask us all and has asked us all. But who do you say I am? You see, for a lot of us, we'll say, well, grandma says this, or my wife says this, or my, my kid says this, or my pastor says this. Who do you say Jesus says? 
It's a question we all have to answer. And for some of us, it takes a long time to answer that. But he asked them, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You're our, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, look here in 17. You are blessed, Simon of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. You know, in this scripture, we see an amazing thing take place. You see, throughout the story of the Gospels, if you kind of begin to look at them, the disciples really had some mixed up ideas about Jesus. Really, they don't truly understand in a lot of ways until basically, you know, Acts 2. Even, even after the ascension, there's still kind of like this moment like, well, are we, are we, is he kind of, how's this going to, and especially before the resurrection. They have these questions. They're not quite sure what's going on. They, they think Jesus is going to do this or going to do that. And so here in this moment, in Matthew 16, Peter makes this confession of faith that is really hasn't been seen before. And Jesus begins to, to say, listen, listen, this is important. You need to get this. And he basically says this confession, Peter, is so vital, not just to you as a person, but to later generations and later individuals that I'm going to build everything upon that. That confession of faith. Look here, I'm, as you look at this scripture with me, there's a couple words you need to understand. You see, Jesus is saying, I'm going to build the church. Okay, listen. I, I know this is Renee and Sarah's first Sunday. They're not going to build a youth program. Jesus will. Now, here's what's great. They will partner with him to make the construction take place. That's why they're here. I am not going to build this church. If you think that I am, I'm sorry. You have unrealistic expectations of me. Jesus will build his church. Jesus is going to do that. There's some faith traditions who kind of look at it and go, well, no, that means Peter's going to do it. No, it doesn't mean Peter's going to do it. Peter's statement of faith and confession of faith is what is going to be used to build it, but Jesus builds it. He's the one that makes it all work. He's the one that puts it all together. And I love this because in a lot of ways, every time there's now a confession of faith, every confession of faith is used by Jesus to build his church. You see, for some of us, we want to go, okay, how, how can we build our church? Well, well, maybe we need to do this fun activity and, and, and have this billboard or do all these things. And listen, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. There isn't. But how does God build his church? By people that come to know him and discover who he is and grow in who he is. Every confession of faith is used by Jesus to build his church. And our job is to partner with him in that construction project. Our job is to not try to figure out, okay, where is the blueprints? How can I write the plans? Our job in a lot of ways is to put on our hard hat, go to work and basically say, okay, Jesus, how are we going to, what do you need me to do today? How can I build today? How can I be a part of what you're doing today? He builds it. He does it. The family partners with him to do that. And so it's amazing that even now, have you ever thought about this? Like how many people right now in this moment are meeting all around our country, all around the world to celebrate Jesus? Like he wants to use us all in this huge construction project. And I think it's amazing. But you know what? I like this. I, I, we don't see this much anymore. Every once in a while, I'll go to somebody's house and I'll see them maybe hidden away. Um, but I used to love these things. You ever have a, maybe you still do. Some of you are going to look at me like, what is that? Family albums? <laughs> you, you, yes, we know what that is. Yes, okay, okay, yeah. Family albums. You know, and you begin to, you pick them up and you begin to look through them. 
And there's the vacation, there's the birth of a child, there's a wedding, there's all these sort of things. And here's the deal. You know what I like about what God's word has done for us? It really has given us a snapshot of the family of God. It's basically said, listen, I want to help you to understand what this looks like. And we see that in Acts 2. In Acts 2, now it's a little bit of scripture here, but let's look at it together. Because I want us to get a snapshot. I want us to be able to look at this together. I want us to open up the family album and go, okay, God, we get it. You want us to be a family. What does that look like with, with skin on? What does that look like moving around, grooving, and just being a part of this? It's simple. Here's what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I remember about 10 years ago around the church, we started to hear all this kind of you know, talk and whispering, you know, it's all about, oh, we want, to need, we want to be the New Testament church. We need to be like the New Testament church. We need to be, and I remember going, okay, so what does that look like? This is what it looks like. People that are community together, people that love each other, people that are taking care of the needs of each other, people that are willing to not just meet in homes privately, but to let their faith be on display to people all around them. It's a quick little snapshot. And here's the deal. Here's the thing. Like we see that and we go, oh, well, I don't know if we could actually be that. I don't know if we could actually be that type of church. Or, or it, it, will that really work in our world today? Because here's the deal. In a lot of ways, our faith, especially in America and the Western mindset, is kind of an individual thing. But here's the deal. Can I tell you something? I cannot find anywhere in Scripture where we see basically an example of living our faith inwardly and not outwardly it's not there it's always about being with people and sharing life with people and being together and all these things and here's the deal you need to get this because I like we read that and we go oh I don't know if we should be that or I don't know if we can be that listen the only thing that makes us different from the early church is they got there first that's it it's the only thing they got there first they were born before you and me because here's the thing, like I read Acts 2, 42 through 47, and I go, yep, Lord, please. Why not? If they could do it, why can't we? Because here's the deal. When you think about it, they had the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We, they, they've experienced a risen Savior. They had a living hope. We have a living hope. Can somebody tell me what the difference is? Because I can't. And I think that's what the Lord wants us to be. A group of people that love each other like that, that care for each other like that, that live our faith outwardly, not just inwardly. Yes, there's, there's a moment where they're in their homes and they're, 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 they're doing these things together, they're eating a meal together, but then they go to the temple courts, they go outside the four walls, quote unquote, of their church, and they make an impact. And because they do all of these things, the Lord adds to their number daily. What does that mean? Simple. Confessions of faith as Christ built his church, which is so good. So to kind of close this out, I want to give you some application so that we understand a few things. What do we need to understand about the family of God? What do we need to understand about it? How can we now take this, use it, and apply it? And here's the deal. We're going to use some scripture to help us to do that found in 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5 says this, As you come to him, the living stone, Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to Him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What we're going to do to kind of close this out this morning is we're going to focus on three two-word phrases that we find written from Peter in 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5 together and kind of break them down and help us to understand a little bit more. Number one, the first two-word phrase is the phrase living stones. And here's the deal. As you look at that scripture, it talks about living stone, capital S, and living stones, lowercase s. We see both of those phrases. 
And what Peter is wanting us to understand in a lot of ways is there is a living stone, capital S, whose name is Jesus. But at the same time, that Jesus is wanting to take us and also have us be a part of what he's doing. And he didn't just say stone, capital S, and stones, little s. He called them living stones. Here's the deal. I've kind of been around church a little while. And I sometimes see Christians, and I see stones. And then I see living stones. What's a living stone? I mean, that kind of is like, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, we don't, you know, if I go out and pick up a rock outside, it's not like that rock is going to jump up in my hand and run away. What is Peter trying to get us to understand? How can we take that understanding and apply it? I think it's this. You can be a stone for Jesus, or you can be a living stone. And a living stone is a stone that understands that, yes, it is going to be a part of a structure, but it wants to understand also that there is community involved in that. There's life that's shared. There's, there's, there's openness and honesty in that. There's, there's the ability to say, you know what? I'm not perfect. It's okay to not be okay. And we share life together. Aaron, why do we do community groups? Is it because all a lot of churches do them? Absolutely not. If you'll learn anything about me, it's I won't do things just because other places do them. If God tells them to do that, awesome. But God may not tell us to do it, so we're not going to do it. That's how it works. Why do we do community groups? Because I want us to be living stones. I want us to do life together every once in a while. Because here's the deal, this is great, this is important, but you know what, come on, I'll be honest, it's not like being in somebody's couch. It's not like walking into their kitchen and sharing life with them. And here's the deal, you know what I've learned about Americans? We're horrible at this. I remember, man, I, I went to Ireland before, before I took the kids, when I was a youth pastor, we went to Ireland. Uh, if you guys want to go to Ireland, oh, uh, we'll pray about it. Um, anyway. <laughs> And they said, Aaron, we want you to come out. We want you to visit. And I'm, I'm like, you mean you want me to come before the kids and, and go to Ireland? Yes. Yes, please. And I went out there. And you know what I heard 458,000 times? You want to come over to the house? Let's have a little tea and coffee. I remember I stayed with some, some, some folks in the church. And it was like 9 o'clock. Now, I don't know about you, but like 9 o'clock is like bedtime. We're heading that direction real quick. And I remember this guy just shows up. And I'm like, you, why, why are you here? <laughs> and they're just like, I'll put the kettle on. I'll put the kettle on. And we sat around that, that, that kitchen table for two hours. And guess what? Oh, we talked about such deep spiritual things. It was, uh, no, we just talked. <laughs> and it was awesome. Yeah. The first Christmas after I got back, I bought my wife a kettle. You see, we need to be a church that says, you know what, I'll put the kettle on. It doesn't matter if it's late. It doesn't matter if it's early. I'm here for you. And that's not always easy for us because in a lot of ways, we want to be living stones apart from everybody else. But that's not what God's Word tells us. That's not what God's Word instructs us to be. And so for some of us, we have just kind of gone from living stones to stones. And here's the deal, and I understand this, and this kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. For some of us, we have become living, we've gone from living stones to stones because other stones have hurt us. There's a lot of church hurt. And again, I'm encourage you. I'm not trying to belittle that hurt. I'm not trying to belittle that pain because I know it's real and I know it hurts because you know how I know? Because I've experienced it too. It hurts. And here's the deal. Just so we make this as clear to everybody as we possibly can. And I've hurt others. But at the same time, at the same time, I don't want to hold that against Jesus. 
I don't want to hold those actions because you know what? Even though I've been hurt, even though you've been hurt, we're still commanded by God in His infinite wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to be willing to look at each other and say, you know what? I'll put the kettle on for you. And have people put the kettle on for us to live life together. Listen, hear me here. We receive life from the living stone who is Jesus so that we can share life in community with each other. You say, Aaron, I just feel like I'm a stone right now. What do I do? Simple. Go to the living stone, capital S, and let him once again bring life to your life. Let him refresh you again. Let him heal you. Let him do what needs to be done in your heart so that you can once again become a living stone and be among living stones together. Second phrase, being built. Being built. Now, notice it doesn't say built because none of us are completely done yet. Come on, I grew up in the church. Maybe you did too. You remember the little song, He's Still Working On Me? He's still working on me. I'm not everything I'm supposed to be yet. You're not everything you're supposed to be yet. We're being built. We're not finished. It's almost like, you know, it sounds kind of strange and weird and probably somewhat cheesy, but, you know, it's like you want to, you, you, you drive down the street, you know, and what do you see? You see the, you know, construction zones, or, or, or the worst thing you see is not that necessarily the construction zone, but the sign that says it will be a construction zone for the next three years. <laughs> I was dri- I don't remember where I was, Federal, no, Sheridan. I was driving down Sheridan, and I, yes, yeah, I was driving down Sheridan, and they're like, from this state to this state, and I just laughed. <laughs> from September 29th to October 5th, we will be doing this, and I'm like, yes, yes, 2024 to 2024, or five, you know. <laughs> Because, you know, they never do it in time, you know. But in some ways, like, we, so, so, you know, why do they do that? You know why they do that? Simple. So you are prepared for a construction site. So you know, hey, I'm going to need to add, add a little extra time. You know, one of the greatest things that we can have as believers and families of God is to understand that we're not perfect and the people we're looking at right now aren't either. Kind of go, you know what, they're in construction. So am I. We're not always going to do this right. We're not always going to say the right thing. We're not always going to do the right thing. But you know what? It's okay. Because he's still working on me. Because here's the deal. Here's the thing that we need to understand that's really important about this. And, and, and I want to use the idea of Legos to make this make sense. Okay? I was not a kid that played with Legos. My brother played with Legos, but Easton loves them. So Easton's got Legos and all these sort of things. And I don't know about you, but I've noticed something about Legos in the last, I say, maybe 10 years. See, when I was a kid... Legos were this crazy thing called a toy for children. <laughs> yes. Do you realize, and maybe you don't because maybe you don't have kids or maybe you have grandkids that are, or, or other, yeah, I don't know. You realize that, that I really believe that Lego is kept afloat by people roughly my age. <laughs> you go into a Lego store now, and yes, you can still go buy your little $30 set. Or you can buy the $500 set. And guess what? They never have those because they're sold out. It's crazy. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. For some of us, us, we kind of need to understand the Lego idea that God has for you. Because here's the deal. That $500 set is not made for a child. That $500 set is made for the individual who likes to put Legos together, probably to connect a little bit with their childhood. There's nothing wrong with that. And set it there as a display piece. That's what it's for. So that people could, I, I've even watched, you know, because Easton, you know, what new Legos are going to come up? So I, I, we go on YouTube and, oh, here's the new Lego sets. And so I'll see these older people and they'll say, and they'll have it. This is my display of, of this or that or, or, or whatever. And again, there's nothing wrong with this at all. Don't misunderstand me. Don't be like, I should get rid of all my Legos. No, no, it's fine. But you need to understand the difference of the sets. You see, for some of us, we think all God is doing in our hearts and our lives is he's doing that because all he wants us to do is be a display set for the people around us. So so God is putting us all together. 
and, and trying to get us all put together. And then we're going to be this display of what it looks like to be just basically the perfect Christian. We see these people in Scripture all the time. They're called the Pharisees. Who basically said, if I could just look the part, I'm going to stand on display. And if you could just act like me, then everything will come together. And here's the deal. Jesus looked at those people and said, you've totally missed it. Yes, you've done all these little things, but your heart is far from me. You may praise me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You, all you care about is being a display piece. Listen, God is not creating you, and he's not creating me, and he's not creating this church to be a display piece. He's using us, and he's building us to be used by him. Because here's the deal. You go into my son's room. Yeah, there's some stuff sometimes that stays on the shelf of his Legos. But you know what mainly happens? He pulls them down. He puts them on his bed. He has a battle. He has this or that. They're all over the place. He uses them. They're play to him. And for some of us, we need to understand that Jesus is not building us to put us on display for the world. He is building us so he can use us to reach the world. He's not fixing you so you can stand up and talk about how wonderful you are. He's fixing you so that you would understand and be able to go out to a world and say, you know what? I was broken, but He healed me. I was hurting, and He rescued me. I felt no hope, and He brought hope to my life. I felt like nobody cared, nobody loved me. But yet Jesus came and he gave his life for me. You see, that's part of understanding what you were meant to do and be as the church. Not to sit here and worry about necessarily how perfect you can make yourself appear. Now listen, I am not in any way, shape, or form. Do not misunderstand what I'm saying here. This says that we shouldn't be growing in him. Absolutely. But we grow and are built not to puff ourselves up, but to show a world what Jesus can really do with broken people, which we all really are. We're being built. Number three, last one, spiritual house. Spiritual house. I love how Peter here uses once again this idea of building and building material. And so I have some building material I brought with me this morning. You know what I've never heard anyone say? I've never had anyone, you know, maybe in Lowe's, not that I'm there that often, but, you know, I've never seen anyone say, man, what potential do I see in a brick? <laughs> never once. You know what's interesting about brick? You see what I did there? We don't even call them brick. We call them bricks. Even if we have one, a lot of times we'll call them bricks. This is a brick, you know, bricks. I have a pile of bricks. And here's the thing what I've learned about bricks. Bricks can be very interesting, but bricks in a lot of ways really fulfill their potential and their purpose when they're connected with other bricks. You see, here's the deal. What if I took these back here? Imagine they've disappeared. And I just said, I have a brick. What can I do with my brick? Well, maybe you're more creative than I am, but I can think of a couple of ideas that I can use my brick for. Number one, doorstop. I can put the brick by the door, set it there, and the door will remain open. Yes. I can also think of a couple other things. Number one, uh, one brick, uh, paperweight. I can set it on my desk and keep the papers from flowing, you know, when the fan's going or something like that. I, again, maybe you're more, maybe more, much more creative than I am, but that's, that's about where I go. That's about it. Paperweight, doorstop. Here's the other thing, though. I can think of other things maybe that I can do with this brick. I can hurt somebody with it. Not going to do this because this would be crazy. I can throw it through a window. I can bring a lot of destruction with this brick. Here's the thing that I think we need to understand. You see, God has never called us to be brick. 
I, I love, even at the beginning, remember, Adam is with God in a very intimate relationship. It's just God and Adam. And yet God says, it's not good for man to be alone. You know what God's saying? It's not good for man to be brick. I'll make a helper. Because here's the thing. When you find yourself disconnected, when you find yourself only as brick, here's what I found. Our lives that are disconnected from the family of God can be very empty and very destructive. And here's the thing you need to understand, and I don't care what lies the enemy has told you throughout your life. I don't care what lies maybe family members or even pastors have said to you throughout your life. God has not called you to be a doorstop or a weapon. So Aaron, what's he called me to? What does this mean? How does this look? You see, if you haven't noticed, maybe check it out when you leave this church. is built with bricks. It's not built with brick. It's built with bricks. And I don't know what happens when you start removing bricks from a structure. But I think I got a pretty good idea that the thing falls down. You see, for some of us, we've believed the lies that the enemy has told us about what it is to build a spiritual house. And we've thought, you know, I don't know if that brick is that. Oh, oh. I guess this brick matters. You see, the spiritual house that God is creating and building, He wants to do it with your brick just as much as mine. Let me break it all down. God has called us to be living stones who are at work, who are a work in progress and are being used to build a spiritual house and into a spiritual family. Every one of us have that opportunity to be built into something that is so much greater than what I could come up with on my own. It's something that God wants and is building. And here's what's awesome. He wants all of us. He wants your brick to be a part of that. Look at this with me in 1 Peter 2, 9. This is what we'll close with. But you, you, this is just after four and five, a couple verses passed, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Listen, I've heard those before, and I know we've heard maybe the scripture before, but listen, if you mark in your Bible, please mark these words, God's special possession. Now here's the deal. This is one of those scriptures that we need to understand because we sometimes read it, we maybe miss the understanding here. We are chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are God's special possession. But there is a reason for that. And Peter helps us to see what that reason is so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wondrous light. What is one way that we accomplish that goal and that mission? We allow our brick to be used by God in the family of God that He's called us to. And I know that's not always easy, but here's the thing you need to understand. Can you do me a favor? Let's do this. Let's, I want just to focus on this. 
as we close. And to do that, I'm just going to ask that you close your eyes. Again, nothing spiritual or weird about it. I just want you to focus. And I'm going to read this scripture a little more personal for all of us. Because I want, you, I want you to allow this to really get into your heart and your understanding. Because again, for some of us, we go, well, I'm not, I'm, I don't, uh, they don't want me to be a part of the family. Or I, I, I think this way and they think that way. So, you know, all, you know we, we make all the excuses. We don't do the things that we know maybe we need to do because we try to act like, well, you know, that's, maybe that's God's word for you, but not for me or whatever it might be. And to close this morning, I want you to hear these words very, very clearly. You see, what Scripture is really telling us is this. You are a chosen person. You are a part of a royal priesthood. You make up a holy nation. You are God's special possession. And he's done all of those things so that you may declare the praises of him. You who have been called out of darkness. You can shine forth his wonderful life. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if we've just kind of been talking about this, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Are you a part of the family? And here's the deal. Like, in this moment, yeah, it'd be real easy for me to talk about Little C Church, but I'm going to start with Big C Church. Are you a part of the family? Have you accepted Jesus? You see, for some of us, it's hard to understand the family of God because we're not a part of it yet. We say, well, Aaron, I, okay, makes sense. So, so, so how, do I, how do I become a part of the family? Scripture tells us. Scripture says if we will believe in our heart, and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. You know what another understanding of that is? When we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and we get to be a part of the family. You see, I could have used Scripture today talking about the spirit of adoption and how that we can now call out to God as Father In fact, the wording that is used really kind of brings forth this idea of really intimate communication. It's kind of almost like the idea of calling God Daddy. But first and foremost, it's it's, it's not as important. Listen, hear me here. It's not as important that you're part of a family, little c, as much as you're a part of a family, big c meaning you're part of God's family because you've accepted Him as your Lord and your Savior. And here's the deal. Once that happens, yeah, then God wants us to get involved and be a part of a little C. But first and foremost, the question is this. Is there anybody here who would say, you know what? I just want to be a part of God's family. I just, I, I'm not going to let maybe my earthly family keep me away from him anymore. I'm not going to let fear keep me away. I, I'm not going to let any of these things. I'm not going to let me trying to fix myself keep me from allowing God to come and really just fix me. And if that's you, listen. Listen, you don't have to leave, hear me, you don't have to leave this morning as an orphan. You see, sometimes I look at the world and I look at our society and I'm going to use a phrase that I've kind of made up here so don't think it's anything really special or crazy, but just hear me. 
And I go, man, that's an orphan mentality. And maybe you were an orphan one day, and I'm not trying to say anything bad about it, but it's like, it's like the orphan mentality is a, is a person in my mind who has no identity because they don't understand who their father is or their mother or whatever. And so they're running around trying to find purpose and life and understanding and hope and love and peace. And those things are only found in Him. And those things are found when you come home to Him. And so this morning, if that's you, and you say, Aaron, I don't know if I always understand all the stuff. I mean, this, the Bible's big, and I don't understand, but I can understand this. And you could say this morning, I understand that Jesus loves me. I understand that Jesus died for me. Not for everybody, for me. And then on the third day, he rose and is alive now. I understand that if I come to him, he'll forgive all the mess ups, all my sin, and make me brand new. Not perfect. That's a process. But I'll be a part of the family. If that's you, I wanted you to do something really, 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 really brave. Everybody's got their eyes closed, so, so this is just so that I can pray for you, okay? And I'm not even going to bring you up front. I'm not going to have you do the hokey pokey. We're going to pray all together in just a minute. But if you'd say, Aaron, I want to be a part of the family. I want to be a part of the family. In about 10 seconds, I'm just going to ask you to look at me. When you look and we make eye contact, you put your head down. And then we're going to all pray together, okay, in just a minute. Because we've got some other things that we need to pray for. But if that's you, just look at me real quick. Make sure I make eye contact with you, okay? Okay? Anybody else? Okay. Cool. Okay, we'll go back to that in a second. For the rest of us, maybe, maybe we've accepted big C. That's good. But now God is calling us to a deeper involvement and understanding and family of little C. Maybe there's some hurt. Maybe there's some reasons why we haven't done that. But listen, I really believe that God is all calling us all to say, you know what? How, how can I let my brick be a part a little bit deeper than I have been? If that's you, God wants to help you in that. If you need it again, man, we, have, we did it a couple months ago now, that spiritual giftings test. We'll, we'll get that to you. We can help you find what God's called you to do. We'll get you more involved and help you in that. But listen, let's, let's once again be a family. And I'm not saying we're, we're horrible at it. I'm just saying I think there's a deeper level of family that God wants us to be. So if that's you, we're going to pray in just a minute for all of this stuff. And so if it's you that said, you know what, I want to be a part of the big C church or the little C church, listen, God hears your prayers. And it's very important that that you hear them as well. There's power in our words. So here's the deal. Here's what we're going to do. If you would, if you're able, let's all stand. Okay? We're going to close. Let's all stand. And then we're going to do something that I don't usually ever have us do. And so I'm going to ask, even if you're not comfortable with it, that you humor me for just a second. And, and, and so... Again, please, can we all come together in this middle section and just hold hands? So if you're on the sides here, come here. So here, come here. Just come, just, just, just move here. Just come. So the, the rows, yeah, just, just, just move your feet. Very good, good, good. I feel like, there you go. Yeah, perfect. No, no, come hold hands. Don't be afraid to touch each other. 
There you go. If you're comfortable, if you're not, it's okay. Just at least get close. Okay? You don't have to come up close. Just, just right here. Okay? I, I, I want us... I think it's important at times that we come together. And, and we do that sometimes by the, the holding of hands and being a little closer. So here's the deal. As we hold hands, as we pray together, literally together, we're going to pray for a couple things. One, for those that need to accept Jesus. And if that's you, if that's you, I'm going to ask that in just a moment you pray with me. And for those that want to understand a little bit more of a family, then we'll pray for that as well, okay? But whatever your need is, I'm going to ask that you pray as I pray with you and for you, okay? Sound good? Father, we come to you right now. And God, we're so thankful that you have called us to do life together. God, the church was not an accident. It was not something that you just decided, oh man, I didn't know we should do this. So I guess it's going to work. God, this was your plan from the very beginning. And we understand, God, that we serve a perfect Savior, not perfect people. And that we understand that sometimes the church can be hard and sometimes families can be hard. But at the same time, God, you have called us to be a family, to be a church. And God, first and foremost, you've called us to be a part of Big C Church. God, so there was people that looked at me. So God, in this moment, God, I pray that those individuals, God, would, would, would just kind of say some of these types of words as it comes from their own heart. Father, God, I love you. I love you. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Jesus, I believe that you're God's son. I believe that you came and you lived a sinless life for me. I believe that you died for me. And on the third day, you rose again. And because you live, I can live. And so Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I understand that what this means is I am now a part of your family. I am now your son. I am now your daughter, God. And you have forgiven me. And now... Now that that has taken place, I ask that you would now help me to grow in you and know you better. Father, for those of us who have already accepted you, but God, we need to once again come together as a church family or as individuals in a family. God, I pray that that we would just make the changes that you've called us to make. That, Father, your Holy Spirit would just speak so clearly to us about these areas and these things and that we would begin to allow you to use us in better ways, in different ways, in closer ways. That, Father, in a lot of ways, we would keep the kettle on for each other and love each other as a family. Father, we understand we're not perfect in this. We understand we're going to make mistakes. We understand that those around us are going to make mistakes. But we're going to choose to love anyway. And be the family that you've called us to be. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. You're so good. And we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So listen, I love you. And I'm so blessed and so humbled to be a part of your family. And I'm so excited about what God has for us as a family. But listen, I'm going to encourage you one last time. Don't be brick. Because right here, one brick, all this, what could God build? What will God build with it? Okay? Love you. Have a great week. A couple things. The cookies are there. Renee and Sarah are here. Have a great afternoon. Just hang out together for a little while. Love on each other for a little bit. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.